no easy retreat. They were to fight as they went. The German army had fought through Russian winters. Its commanders understood winter warfare. They set up defensive positions on the high ground and in the warmth of the towns. The Americans lived out in the woods. Most of the time we were in foxhole by ourselves. Occasionally we'd be with some, and we were foxhole was probably scattered out anywhere from 30 to 50 yards apart. You had very little contact with anybody. Well, the ground was frozen in the first place to such a depth that uh, you could hardly get down the first uh, eight inches or so. It was just frozen like uh, uh, concrete, and uh, you just had to chip it away. Consequently, we uh, found ourselves using uh, old foxholes, ones that had been, uh, or sled trenches, that had been dug uh, either by the enemy or by ourselves. Of course, uh, if you were occupying enemy holes, they knew where they were, so there was a certain amount of risk either way you went. But once you got in, if you were there any period of time, and we usually weren't, you start trying to improve it by putting logs over the top of it uh, to uh, shield you from uh, tree bursts of uh, artillery. They just shelled us continuously. If you got out of your hole, you'd liable to get blown away. It's a screaming sound to the 88s, which was a major artillery on the part of the Germans. Uh, and the first is absolutely frightening, a nightmare. I eventually you get accustomed to it, you begin to make judgments about it. Is it coming in close? Is it going to go far or what? And you begin to be able to estimate pretty much where it's going to hit. You can't fight back. Most people just kind of double up like that and hunker down, as they say, and hope that uh, somebody else, not you, gets it. The Americans were now on the attack. Each day, the men had to come out of their holes and advance into artillery fire. The Germans had superior guns, and still plenty of them. Artillery accounted for half of all American casualties in the bulge. You had uh, people killed in many different ways. And uh, you would see hands around, arms, bodies, uh, you'd see uh, a whole body there horribly chopped up. People didn't crumple and fall like they did in the Hollywood movies. They were tossed in the air, they were uh, whipped around, they was uh, hit to the ground hard and uh, blood splattered everywhere and uh, a lot of people uh, were standing close to people and found themselves covered in blood and flesh uh, of their friends. And, that, and that's a pretty tough thing for uh, anybody to handle. And uh, we were no exception to that. We had a staff meeting every morning on the operational situation, the intelligence situation, and always a manpower report on the casualties from the day before. As the G.I.s crept forward in the Ardennes, their generals sifted reports from the front. They were grim. Patton's army, known for its speed, was covering less than a mile a day. The attack from the north was even slower. Ike remained 200 miles back at Versailles. The front was not his only worry. He was trying to keep the peace within his command. There, there were severe strains during the Battle of the Bulge. Montgomery was perceived in the American army as a, as a rather arrogant, stubborn little fellow. I think General Bradley and others feared that if Monty ever got his hands on our army, he'd never let go. For months, Monty had been badgering Eisenhower for control of the ground war. After the German breakthrough, Ike had reluctantly given him command of Bradley's troops in the north. But Monty wanted more. He demanded permanent control of all American ground troops. Ike was sick of the field marshal and threatened to have him fired. 
On the 9th of January, an angry Bradley made the dispute public. Hitler was delighted. This was just the fight he'd hoped for. It took a stirring speech by Winston Churchill to get the Allied generals back in line. The war went along and every day was like the day before. It was a seven day a week job that went on forever. For relaxation, General Bradley did algebra problems. And he worked at integral calculus when he was flying an airplane or flying in his airplane. He said it relaxed him, made him think. We were always thinking about food. We were always thinking about the cold and how to get warm or how to get dry. And uh, we were always thinking about sleep. Uh, you were lucky if you got two or three hours sleep. And when, if the sun ever did come out, and it did finally during the latter part, uh, it almost put you to sleep just immediately. You got extremely tired. When you're marching, carrying a pack, and you're going 10, 20 miles up toward the front, you're numb. You're tired. And uh, you can go to sleepwalking. It's been done. It's been done a lot. Except uh, the road takes a turn, you go into the ditch. It's very difficult to sleep if you're shivering with cold. Uh, one of the things that you would do, you lie down on your side, you bring your knees up and you'd be paired with another guy who's facing you, so your knees would go into his stomach and your head around his head. You have two people in the womb position taking advantage of that position to preserve body heat and life. Another way of doing it to keep you off the snow is uh, you take three persons, three men, and you put your arms around each other's shoulder so that you got three bodies, if you will, propping each other up. And then you, you lower your head, and you, you go off to sleep, standing up. You never really went off into a deep sleep, sort of half awake, half asleep. I would go to sleep at night, and uh, my feet would get cold, and I, I would wake up, and they were numb, and I'd start kicking them together and get circulation started again, and, uh, and I was good maybe for another hour or so. I had frozen toes. My big toes were as big as a, much bigger than a golf ball. And I had many men that I had to send back and that had feet amputated at the ankles. Some of them would just lose their toes. Halfway through the Battle of the Bulge, the Army was still waiting for its main shipment of winter boots. Men suffering from frozen feet were given whiskey or distilled alcohol to drink which only made things worse. Some 15,000 soldiers were taken off the line with frostbite. We went out at dark, as close to the German lines as we could get, and I was to report back to Lieutenant Clausen and re just report what we'd seen or heard that night. So I went back to the house and told Lieutenant Clausen I didn't, we didn't hear or see anything. Uh, he called, I, my name was Pork Shops in our, <laughs> and he said, Pork Shops, you go ahead and lay down here and go to sleep, and I'll wake you when I need you. So this was like 7 o'clock in the morning, and I didn't wake up about 12 o'clock that night. And when I woke up, I, I, I almost instantly noticed there was something wrong with my feet, and they'd swollen up about a third bigger than, than they were, you know, and uh, hurt then. And within three days, I was back in England in a hospital. I saw people that were being evacuated with frozen feet, and uh, their feet were just as black as coal. Uh, kind of maybe a gun steel blue, if you want to put it that way. And in the first stages, they swell it quite a bit. But then after that, when they start turning blue and everything, they get almost flat. Kind of turns your stomach, I guess. Uh, it was a bad sight. If you didn't get circulation back in an X number of days, I can't remember, four or five days, then there was a good possible possibility the grand green had, was setting in or had set in, and if you went another three or four days and you didn't start getting feeling, they amputated feet. And I do know there was one boy just about three bumps me. He'd been there a few days before. And 
when they informed him that he was going to have to have his left foot removed, I mean, that boy like went crazy. People do get hurt, people get wounded, people die in war, and uh, there always had to be a stream of replacements coming in, particularly for the rifle companies. It was a critical situation, and we were not getting the replacements that we needed. Infantrymen made up only 10% of the total American army, but they took 70% of the casualties. 